boldly confess your words working mightily in us today mightily in me and it is bringing to pass everything you've said to will and do your good pleasure and I thank you for it in Jesus name and in agreement with that we said together amen all right God bless you you may be seated children young people you may go reverently with your staff and let's open our Bibles this morning to first Peter chapter 4 continuing these thoughts on the blessing of Abraham that belongs to Jesus. It was given freely to Him. And we began this thought and these thoughts years ago, actually in 2015. I was in here praying and the Lord said to me, Tell my people to examine in depth and in detail. Tell my people to examine in depth and in detail what I've done for them, what I've given to them in the person and work of my Son. Tell them to examine it until they can embrace it as theirs. Embrace it until they experience it in their life. The gospel needs to be experienced. And then he said, tell them to experience it until they enjoy it. And then he began to say to me, when my people can examine, embrace, experience, and enjoy the gospel, then they will become an expression of who and what I am in the earth under my glory. And that's what God really has designed in Ezekiel 47, that the temple, good morning temple, you're the temple, has a river flowing out of it that would flow to the ankles, the knees, the loins, and then could not be passed over. The ankles speak of our walk, our knees speak of bending in worship, the loins speak of our witness, we no longer are producing our own image. Blessed are the eunuchs in the kingdom of God. Remember Jesus said, some are eunuchs born that way, some are made eunuchs of men, but blessed is he who makes himself a eunuch for the kingdom of God's sake. What does he mean? Just step into the river, up to your waist, and you can't produce your own image anymore. I have no image to produce. His image is in me, and his image is being produced through me to his glory. And then there's a river that cannot be passed over. And that's the wisdom of God. And that's what the world needs desperately right now. They need the wisdom of God. And we know that the wisdom of God is personified in the person of Jesus and in the covenant called the new covenant God's given to us. And so that being said, God wants his people blessed. And we begin to look at the things that belong to Jesus. Jesus is, first of all, he's affirmed by the Father. And we're joint heirs with Christ, so we're affirmed by the Father. Then Jesus was exalted. And there's no one as high as Jesus will ever be as high as Jesus. And we've been exalted with him. We've been quickened with, raised with, and made to sit with him in heavenly places. And that's who we are now. I am a new creature in Christ. My life is in Christ. Christ lives in me. And I'm alive, very much alive today. My old man died, not my new man. This new man lives. I'm a new man in Christ. I'm living in him. He's living in me. It was my old man that died. The old man is always dealt with through the cross. The new man belongs in the throne. And one reason the church has never been able to make that distinction is because of the confusion that comes from the pulpit. My old man was crucified. My new man is quick and raised, made to sit with him in heavenly places. I'm an heir of God, joined heir with Christ. That's who you are. And any other thought about who you are now should be unacceptable to you. It just simply will not work. And so I'm quickened with, raised with, seated. I've been exalted with him. And then God glorified the name of Jesus. That's his inheritance. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 4 tells us, He by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than every other messenger. So God glorified the name of Jesus, but then he gave that name to us. Now, he's not glorified my name or your name, but he did give us the name that is glorified and told us whatever we do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus. Pray in the name, preach in the name, give in the name, love in the name. It's all in the name of Jesus. This is his commandment that we believe on the name of his son, Jesus. And then we begin to look at this, that he had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly place because in Revelation 5, 12, John the Revelator said when they saw the Lamb said, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive blessing, glory, honor, power, wisdom, riches, strength. Blessing, glory, honor, power, wisdom, riches, and strength. So the lamb received all blessing. Jesus is blessed today. Every blessing belongs to Jesus. 
And because we're an heir of God, joined heir with Christ, the Greek word for blessing is eulogio. And it means the final word or the final say. We actually use that word in English, eulogy. So when someone dies and we preach a funeral, we do a eulogy. It's the last statement over them. It's a revelation and reflection of how we love them, how we felt about them, how we feel about them, our heart, our hurt. It's a revelation. Well, this new covenant is God's eulogy over both an old man and a new man. God has eulogized that old man, and God said that old man was completely, totally, absolutely unacceptable. And thus, he was crucified and put to death. God eulogized him and said, that's done. But this new man God has eulogized and said, my final word over you is, you are blessed, you are filled with my spirit, you're anointed, you're appointed, you're ordained, you're filled, you're free, you're full, you're full of the blessing of the Lord that makes you rich, you are the blessed of the Lord. That's God's eulogy, and he's not going to change his mind. He's not going to change his mind. He has eulogized your new man. You are quickened with, raised with, and seated with him in the heavenly places. And that blessing that's on Jesus translates to us, the believer, in this thought of the blessing of Abraham. We that are of faith are blessed with, being a joint heir with Christ, we are blessed with faithful Abraham. So God began to have me study the life of Abraham. Abraham was blessed with a specific blessing in the spirit. He's righteous by faith. In the soul realm, God brought him to rest against hope. He believed in hope. In the realm of the body, he was rejuvenated. And when God breathed in him, he lived 76 more years and lived to be 175 years old and was strong until the day he died. By whose stripes you were healed. Himself took our infirmities, bare our sickness, and carried our disease. And the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He'll quicken your mortal body. We're believing God to be younger and stronger and quickened in the name of Jesus. Caleb, Barzilla, two men under the old covenant. Both had great leaders. Both served nobly. Both were great men according to God's testimony. One doubted. The other had a spirit of faith. The only difference between Barzilla and Caleb was the word of faith. Caleb said, this day I'm strong. God is my strength. He kept me alive. Give me my mountain. Barzilla said, let me go die. That's what they believed and what they said. So thank God. Abraham's blessing belongs to us in our body. Abraham got quickened in his body. And lady Sarah got rejuvenated in her body. And so you are never called daughters of Rachel or Rebecca. You are called daughters of... Sarah in 1 Peter chapter 3 got a right to have your body rejuvenated to be strong and healthy every day you live you're blessed in your health in Jesus name so we're expecting to get healthier as we get older now that's not the way the world thinks that's not the way the world operates and that's certainly not the way that they tell you things are going to go they tell you at 40 expect this at 50 expect this at 60 expect this but what we have is an expectation from the word of God I'm expecting to be well I'm expecting to be healed every day I live in the name of Jesus. Praise God. I'm up. I'm well. I'm out of a deathbed, out of a sickbed, feel better than I ever have. And I'm thankful today. God is my health and strength. That belongs to the seed of Abraham. And then in the social arena, Abraham took this posture. Let there be no strife between me and you. Even when, when Lot was wrong, even when Lot had no promise, and he began to fuss, and everything Lot had was because Abraham was blessed. It's not because Lot was blessed. He proved that when he separated from Abraham, man, he started uh, stumbling and fumbling, and he got, he got into curse and corruption. It didn't take him very long to do it. His blessing operated through Abraham. And Abraham said, listen, don't let there be any strife between you and me. You choose. If you choose right, I'll go left. If you choose the good plains of Sodom, I'll go the other way. And he let Lot choose. He would not get in strife. And, you know, that's the heart that we have. We're just not going to fuss and fight with people. We're not going to argue with people. I'm going to walk in love. And if people are going to oppose me and find fault and criticize with me, I just open my Bible to, to the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, 6, and 7. And that tells me that if people keep troubling me, God will find something else for them to do. I'm being kind. God said it's a righteous thing for me to trouble them that trouble you. And that's not old covenant, that's new covenant. Now, I personally don't want anybody to get in trouble. I don't, want to, I don't want to see the Lord trouble anybody. That's not my heart. But if and however people keep opposing the gospel, if they keep opposing the ministry, if they keep opposing the word of the Lord and the house of the Lord, eventually God will have to deal with them and will indeed give them something else to do. 
He will draw their attention away from you and me. Praise God. And so now we're on the financial arena, and Abraham was blessed financially. And with great material wealth and blessing, Abraham was blessed financially. So I'm going to be bold this morning. God wants you blessed financially, supernaturally blessed in your finances. And Father wants to talk to us about our finances. So very quickly, I shared with you we preach the gospel to the poor. And there's poverty in every arena. We preach the gospel to the poor. Then I showed you the prophet Haggai's message to the house. They had neglected the house of the Lord. And that neglect of God's house opened up a hole in the bag of their finances. And Haggai said, because you've neglected my house, then there's a hole in the bag of your finances. And we know that there's a, a bag with a hole in it. There's a barrel where people scrape by. There's a basket full. And then there's a barn full. God's called us to the barn level. But one reason we've never walked in that so far is because I've never even heard that preached. I'm going to preach a little bit of it this morning, but I've never heard that preached. You know, if you get your basket blessed, thank God, when you got what you need and your wallet's full and, you know, you can do if you have, need a refrigerator, you can just pay cash for it. That's better than, way better than most people do. To be debt free and have plenty more to lay in store. That's what God wants to do for us because he doesn't want us encumbered with the spirit of debt and the spirit of mammon because it drains us. Ain't nothing in the world that will drain you like financial problems and financial pressure and difficulties that come. And so there's the prophet's message. And then we looked at the provision of grace. Jesus was made poor on the cross. 2 Corinthians 8 9. I'm waiting on a good amen. amen. Jesus was made poor on the cross. Let me quote it to you. 2 Corinthians 8 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich... Yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich, enriched. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.5, enriched in all things, utterance and knowledge, coming behind and no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus, even as the testimony of God in Christ was confirmed in you. That's God's portion for us, and it's rich in every dimension. It's not just finances, but it doesn't exclude finances. Jesus was hungry on the cross, thirsty on the cross and naked on the cross and in one of all things having no need met. Under the curse of the law in Deuteronomy 28, 45 through 50. That's Deuteronomy 28, 45 through 50. The curse of the law, God said, you will be hungry, you will be thirsty, you will be naked and you'll have no need met. You'll be in one of all things. And Jesus took our natural physical poverty on the cross. The cross was a perfect work. Jesus bore every bit of the curse. He bore it all. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through faith, and we might receive the promise of the Spirit. That's God's word. Now I'm not going to doubt God's word. I believe what God said. Now that being said, we have that truth, and then we looked at prosperity of the soul, because God wants your soul to prosper. You know, you can have a dump truck load of money and be as poor as all get out. Money can bankrupt you. Money has a spirit with it, and God wants your soul to prosper. When your soul starts prospering, then you start growing and developing and maturing in your ability to follow God and operate the way God wants you to because soul prosperity is eliminating the other thoughts. Soul prosperity is you learning how to think the thoughts of God God's way and let the mind of Christ operate in you. And when we start thinking about things the way God does, then things start shifting. Praise God. And now we're looking at this priority of stewardship. And so we read 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. Every man hath received the gift. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, to both sinner and saint, as good stewards of the manifold or multifaceted or five dimensions, spiritual, mental, physical, social, financial, the manifold grace of God. This grace is multifaceted, it's deep, it abides in every realm, and grace is to impact the way we deal with our finances, our money, and our material possessions. The manifold grace of God. So look at this with me under stewardship. You see the matchless gift. You receive the gift. Who's the gift? Jesus. He's the matchless gift. I've received Jesus. I didn't receive the church. I didn't receive a doctrine. I received Jesus. 
And within Jesus is every gift of the Spirit, every gift of God, every good and perfect gift is in Jesus. Jesus is the unspeakable gift. There's the matchless, marvelous gift of Jesus that I have received. Then there's the message of the gospel. This is good news. Jesus is good news. Jesus is good news this morning. Jesus came to save, heal, and deliver broken, crying, dying, hurting, broken humanity. The gospel's good news. The church is full of good news. If we just listened to God, we'd be full of good news today. We'd be filled with good news because the gospel's good news. But then you'll notice the method of God. The method of God here is the seven ships. And this is one of the ships. There's relationship, lordship, worship, discipleship, fellowship, stewardship, leadership. And those seven ships are God's method. They're not the message. Jesus crucified, died, buried, quick and raised, seated. What he's doing at the right hand of Father, that's the message. But how God works that in your life, he wants a relationship with you. He wants your life under his lordship. He wants you to become a worshiper. God's looking for the worshiper. He wants you to become a disciple. He wants you to take his word. He wants you to fellowship with his sons and daughters, fellowship with his people. He wants you to become a steward of your time, your talent, your treasure, your temple, the truth he shows you, your own testimony he gives you, and then everything he trusts you with. The steward becomes the governor. He governs. He guards. He grounds. He grows. He guides. He glorifies God and gives through stewardship. That's God's plan. We will never be stewards of the mysteries of God if we don't learn to be faithful. The principle is simple. Faithful in least, faithful in much. Faithful in unrighteous mammon, which is money. Faithful with the true treasures of an almighty God. Faithful in that which belongs to another. Faithful in that which is your own. By the way, Jesus taught that. And there's a great deal, a great deal of truth in that. You know, when I wanted a car when I was 15, 16 years old, my father put me to a test. We had two cars. We had a little Toyota, and my dad had a nice car. And the Toyota had been my sister's, you know, and she got killed, so they just kept it. They were going to give it to me. And so that became my trust. He taught me, if you can't be faithful in another man's, then you can't be faithful in what is your own. So he taught me, when you bring that Toyota back after you've been out on Friday night, you bring it back full of gas. And if I, if I give it to you clean, I want it back clean. And my dad was always meticulous about his cars. He always kept it full of gas. You know, if it went under three quarters, he thought we were bankrupt. Because he grew up in the Depression. He just had that mentality. You don't ever let your gas tank get below half, boy. Don't ever. My dad never run out of gas one time in his life. If it gets below half, man, you, you better find a filling station quick. So he said, if that, if that car has less than a full tank, when you bring it back, you fill it up. You take it and wash it. You wax it. You take care of it. If you go out here and blow that car up, then you'll walk. Because that thing only had a little four-cylinder sewing machine motor in it, you know. It wasn't, it wasn't, those first Toyotas, this was made in 1971. It's when Karen bought that in 1971. Those first Toyotas, all they had was a sewing machine motor in it. Probably didn't have but about 90 horsepower in it. And you step on that and you didn't go very far very fast. It wouldn't run but about 65 miles an hour. It's a nice little car, but, you know, you could burn those up. And he says, you go out here and burn that up and blow it up, hot rod with your friends. And I said, Dad, you can't hot rod this car. I'd have to push it off a cliff to make it go 100. But I learned some things about stewardship. And then he told me when I was 18, getting ready to go in ministry, turning 19, he said, now I'm going to help you get a car. And he said, I'm going to help you. And when he went, and then he got me a nice car. And he said, now the same way you learn to take care of that little Toyota, take care of this one, and it will always be a blessing to you. You learn to take care of what's another's man. Another man's, you'll learn to take care of what's your own. Amen. Just, just practical wisdom. Jesus taught that. That's stewardship. There's the method of God. So you can't violate God's method. You know, the kingdom doesn't work your way. You have to learn to do things God's way. And God will always be leading you in those seven ships. There's never a time that he won't be leading and developing those seven ships in your life because that's not the message, but it's the method. And God works by method. And if you violate method, you'll stop your growth and maturity. Can you receive that? And then here he says, we're ministers of the manifold grace of God. We become good stewards. And so simply said, and very quickly this morning, stewardship starts with the Father. 
God doesn't ever require anything of you first. He gives to you first. He first loved us. He will first give blessing to you. He doesn't require anything from you. It starts with Father. He gives to you first. Then secondly, He wants you to surrender yourself. What God really wants is you. This is not about wallet and money. It's about you. He wants you, Miss Joyce. The Father wants you. He loves you. Jesus died for you. Didn't die for money. He died for you. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, they first gave themselves to the Lord. Their stewardship. My first sacrifice, my first gift, my first offering is me to the Lord. Keep that in order. Then he says, number three, seek first the kingdom of God. And the kingdom is righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. And that's not your righteousness. It's not your peace, it's not your joy, and it's not your Holy Ghost. That's His. You seek it, and He freely gives it to you. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. And then we notice when the church takes its place in stewardship, Paul said, I exhort first of all that society has a foundation. You know, the foundation of society is the church operating in stewardship because we are praying for every man. We are praying for kings and for those that are in authority. We are offering supplication, prayer, intercession, and giving of thanks for all men. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. You see, that's what God's after. And He's blessed us in America to lead a quiet and peaceable life. There's nobody hindering us or hassling us as we preach the gospel this morning. There's nobody coming in with a gun to shut us down. There are some countries where we couldn't do what we're doing this morning. We lead a quiet and peaceable life that we may share the gospel. And you'll find that in 1 Timothy chapter 2. When the church is a steward of what God gives, I'm going to pray for anyone that's in the White House. It doesn't matter who it is. I'm going to sincerely pray for our leaders, our legislators, our Supreme Court. I pray for the congressmen, the senators. And we all know it's real easy to badmouth people in Washington. It, it's not hard, especially when you hear and see things. Like one man said, I don't see why everybody's mad at the politicians. They ain't done nothing. Meddling right along, hallelujah. Meddling right along. So I'm praying for this president. I'm praying for every leader we have. I'll pray for the next one. Somebody said, what if you don't like him? It didn't ask me if I like him. God said, pray. First Timothy 2, 1. Society will function better if the church will take its place and quit condemning and criticizing those people and pray for them. And I promise you, you can't pray for anybody that you're always bad-mouthing. That won't, you cannot pray for anybody that you always have something bad to say about. I was with a pastor of a large church and under the last president's administration, we were listening, I was in his home and we were listening to the, the State of the Union and he just did not like the last president and he was all upset and getting tore up. And I said, well, my brother, let's me and you get down on our hands and knees right here and I'll get down with you and let's pray. And he said, you pray, I'll listen. He couldn't even pray for the man. And I thought to myself, now, I'm not going to get myself in a place where I can't obey 1 Timothy chapter 2. I exhort, first of all, prayer, supplication, intercession, giving of thanks be made for all men, kings and in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. For this is good. God said it's good, acceptable. In the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved everywhere and come to the knowledge of the truth, there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all in due time to be testified of. And then Paul said, I'm made a minister according to the dispensation of grace. And then he said, I would therefore that the church everywhere lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting, praying and believing God. Society's foundation becomes sure when the church takes its place in stewardship. And then there's the sowing of our finances, which is also part of our stewardship. So let's go to Proverbs chapter 3. Turn there with me. And this is where we ended last time. And I haven't been in the pulpits. This is two weeks. This is the third week. So uh, maybe we've let some of these thoughts slip. But remember that I told you that in every chapter of Proverbs, there's wisdom. I read Proverbs 11 this morning. Today's the 11th. I found three or four things Father had hidden for me there just for today. The book of Proverbs is incredible. God's got things there, hidden things. There were some things there. And you know, the end of the book of Proverbs talks about giving and sowing. And that's what I'm going to be teaching on this morning. It's wonderful. So this is what he said in Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Stewardship now. Stewards of the grace of God. Honor the Lord with your substance. In the new covenant, my substance is my faith. Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is the substance. So what I believe is going to honor God. 
What I believe is going to dishonor God. That's my choice. I believe what God said. I'm going to honor God with my faith. Faith. Then finances, the first fruits of all thine increase. The word increase here in the Hebrew language means material goods, finances, or to have increase in the financial arena. So he says, now, go ahead and sow first. Give God priority in your finances. Honor God in the tithe and offering. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Now, there's four things here that I want to show you, and then I want to give you some thoughts about finances and stewardship, and we'll close this morning. Notice my faith honors God. I believe God, don't you? And I don't believe God any more than I believe His Word. I can't trust a God that I can't trust His Word. He gave you the Bible so you'd believe. The Scriptures reveal the living Word and the plan, the heart, the mind, the thought of God. I must believe the Scripture. As it is written, we have believed according to the spirit of faith. 2 Corinthians 4.13 So, I honor God with my faith. Then I honor God with my finances. And then there is the fullness of God in the fourth dimension. God wants me to learn and grow to live in that fourth place or that fourth dimension. And there's all kinds of revelations of that in your Bible. But barns being filled with plenty means that we will be well off in the material arena. Well off in the material arena. Now I know that that has a bad connotation with a lot of people. But God's never planned His people be broke. That's not God's plan. And I'll prove it to you. If He loves poverty, He is a hypocrite because He don't live in it. When I read about where he dwells, it is a place of amazing splendor, amazing glory, wonderful beauty, and everything there functions in the realm of fullness. Everything. Everything that functions where he is in that realm of spirit overflows all the time. He's never had a shortage there. He's never had lack there. He's never had lack of supply. One old preacher said he does not sit on a threadbare throne. Neither does he have angels that are laid off. He's just a prosperous God and we're his people. And that should be poured out on us and reflected in how we operate. And then the flow of the kingdom is in the new wine. He saved the best wine till now. And that wine represents the blood of Jesus and the flow of the Spirit. And God wants us to just break forth, burst. I mean, a bursting is a breaking forth. God wants you to flow in the blood of Jesus on that mercy seat and the covenant. And God wants you to flow in the Spirit of God and the gifts and in the fruit. He wants a flow in your life. He wants it to flow like a river. We were never meant to live dry lives. We're meant to live in the flow. Praise God. Can you see that? That's your stewardship of your finance. Sowing of finances is important. Now, just five simple thoughts this morning. Some things that the Lord said to me about finances and sowing finances that He wanted me to talk about in the blessing of Abraham. So number one this morning is this. We need to repent of wrong thinking and the mindsets that disagree with God's Word. My money is spiritual, not carnal. God made the material arena. God made a man and put him in a material world. Material things are not evil or ungodly. God made those things, not man, not the devil. God made those things. So every one of us need to repent of some things that we think. And you know that's true in every arena. I've still got a lot of repenting to do. There's some things that I still think that aren't right. And what I think must be measured by what God said. Now watch this. It's an old illustration, but watch this. You know, when th this is a $50 bill. It's a $50 bill. It's a $50 bill. And when you go outside the church, you know, if you've got a big car, put some gas in it and see what $50 does. You've got a big car, $50 won't fill it up anymore. You've got a family of four or six, go to the movie theater. And I dare you to buy condiments. Go ahead, get drinks and popcorn. They want to mortgage on your house to buy drinks, popcorn, and candy at a movie theater. That stuff's expensive. It's outrageous. It's outrageous. I was, I, we took Anthony to the circus. They, back when Anthony was a wee little fellow, we had a snowstorm come through Hampton, Virginia, where we were at Bethlehem, Judah. And he wanted to see, they kept advertising this thing. This is the final tour of Gunther Gable Williams, the great lion tamer and tiger master. And Anthony got all caught up in Gunther Gable Williams. And so we were supposed to go. 
and then we couldn't go because of the snow. And so finally, they had one last show on Saturday afternoon. And so here Teresa and I are. We got Anthony in our arms, and we're taking him. And we got up to the window, and all that was left was the last row on the top of the Hampton Coliseum. And I usually don't go that high without a parachute. That's high. You need binoculars to see elephants up that high. That's a big arena. That will seat about 14,000 people. You've got to be way up there. And the lady, and those tickets in the paper were like $10 a piece. And the lady said, and you've got to remember now, there's about, at least, and I'm not exaggerating, at least 1,000 people behind us. And they've got several windows operating. And I stepped up there and she said, uh, that'll be $50, or I think it was $48 for the three tickets. And I said, it's supposed to be 30 She said, $48, take it or leave it. $48 to sit in a place where you can't even see elephants. And I'm thinking, you know what? I got a good mind to ditch this. I don't need this. But then Anthony, I want to see Gunther Gable Williams. I want to see him, Daddy. So you know what I did? I pulled out the 48 bucks. We get in there. Then he, needs a, he wants a lightsaber. You know, one of those swords with a light on it. Now, normally they're $10, but now this is the last show. And since they had snow and, and some shows didn't get, now they're $25. You know what I did? I gave the guy 25 bucks. Now, this, this, that was bad, but this beat all. The guy's coming up through there, popcorn, peanuts, snow cone. Anthony says, I want a snow cone. I thought, okay, surely two bucks for a snow, seven bucks for a snow cone for colored ice. I walked out of there, 48 for the tickets, 25 for the saber, 7 for a snow cone. And I said, I will fast till three weeks from now before I buy anything here to eat. I walked out of there with 73, 80 bucks that should have cost me about 50. And that was in 1993. But anyway, the guy behind me, he was an older guy and he had his grandson with him. And he leaned up to me and he said, you know what? Jesse James wore a mask. And I didn't know what he meant, but I do now. I'm thinking, I'll feel more comfortable. If you'll pull a gun on me and put a mask on, I'll feel more comfortable. You're robbing me. If you, if you really want me to feel comfortable, point the gun at me. You're robbing me. And that old man said, Jesse wore a mask. Carried a gun. <laughs> hey, go buy a car. 50 bucks ain't much. Go buy a house. 50 bucks ain't much. Go buy groceries. I come out of there the other night, I'm looking at that stuff, 68 bucks. I'm thinking, I got, you know what you do, you go home and you get the receipt out and you add it all up and you just can't believe there's 68 bucks in that basket. There's no way. Yeah, it's true, because $50 don't do much. And we all know that this is the incredible shrinking American dollar. It just doesn't do as much. Right? Now, that's our mindset. Now, when you get in church, the Lord says, I want you to give $50. Look what happens. First thing you, first thing you think, that's a lot of money. That's a bunch of money. 50 bucks is a bunch of money. Lord, Lord, you being hard on me today, 50 bucks is a bunch of money. <laughs> See, here's the wrong thought the church has. Do you know that as long as 50 bucks looks like this out there and 50 bucks in here, the church is going to struggle. And that's the reason. Because double-minded people are what? They're unstable and all. Out there, it's 50 bucks. That's what 50 bucks looks like. But in here, that's what 50 bucks looks like. Do you see that? Hmm. How could you not see it? Seven bucks for a snow cone. How could you not see that? So what people don't realize is this. Is that we're a church. <laughs> we're a church. And so the water bill here is about twice what it is at my house. And we use more water at my house on one day of taking showers and washing clothes than we do in a month here. But the water bill's higher. We use a lot more electricity at my house 
than we do here because we don't, we don't run these units. When, when I'm in the office or we're working on Wednesday, we use small portable space heaters. We don't ever turn the units on. A lot of times when I come here and pray, I may put a space heater on over there and go warm myself and come pray. We don't do that because it's very expensive to do that. But you know, we use more electricity over there at my house in one day than probably we will here in three or four weeks, at least in four or five days. But yet the power bill here is four to five times more than what we pay at my house because it's called commercial. And the moment you become commercial, you just tripled everything you do. The insurance is commercial. The light bill is commercial. The water bill is commercial. There's a mortgage payment on it. And so it just goes on and on. So we need to repent of our wrong thinking about finances. Now let me hurry this morning. Genesis 13, 2 said, Abraham was rich in cattle, silver, and gold. And the word rich there in Genesis 13, 2 in the, in the Hebrew language is the word kabod. And we all know that word means glory. You've heard of the Shekinah, and you've heard of the Kabbat. It's glory. But it also has a negative connotation of heavy, weighty, and grievous. Heavy, weighty, and grievous. And so in Genesis 13, 2, when you look at it, Abraham is rich, and he's wealthy with money and material goods, but it's grievous to him. Do you realize that money can become very grievous? Not only money, but the lack of it. But then in Genesis chapter 14, in the last few verses of the chapter, when he's talking to the king of Sodom, he lifts up his hands and he said, I bless the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a shoe latchet from your shoe, because you'll say you made Abraham rich. God had dealt with his thinking. That word is not kabod, it's the Hebrew word ashar, which means you have made me great or God hath made me enriched or God hath supplied me. And there's a big difference between having a lot of money and being supernaturally supplied. And Abraham said, you'll say you supplied me because Abraham turned down the wealth of five kingdoms. Five kingdoms. He conquered five kings and their wealth, and he turned it down, and he said, I don't need that money, I don't need that. What I need is El Elyon, which he received from Melchizedek. That's what I need. I need to be connected to God more than I need a dump truckload of money. And that's what God wants us to see. If we want to do the ministry God's given us to, more than we need a dump truckload of money. And you know, when you think, if we just had the money, you've got to stop thinking like that. We don't have the money today, but we have a God today. We don't have the money, but we've got a God that's bigger than any lack. We've got a God that's bigger than anything we're facing. We have El Elyon with us. And he is the source of supply. And that's what Abraham learned there. He repented of his thinking because as long as he had silver, gold, and cattle, it was a burden to him. He was dependent on the money. And I know pastor in a church, you start looking at the money. You look at the finances and you look at what came in and you look at what goes out. And you're always trying to make ends meet. And you're always trying to get the budget right. And you're always trying to make the books balance. Oh, it's just on and on. And I'm learning to lay that down. I have a God. I have a God. He's El Shaddai. He's the Almighty God. He supplies me. He takes extravagant care of me. He's blessing open door. He's kept us alive. He's kept us this far. He's a mighty God and a great God. So we need to repent. We don't need the money. We need Him and He'll supply the money. The moment you put that money in His place, then you start struggling spiritually in every other way because what we need to complete what God called us to do here is not money we need Him He'll supply the money He'll supply the people He'll supply the builders He'll supply whatever needs to be supplied you don't need the money you need Him number two you need to remember the warning that God gave us through the Apostle Paul and temptations that come with money you need to remember this First Timothy chapter 6, he said some very profound things. He said, there are men who are disputers of truth, who have not the truth in them and don't love the truth, and they suppose that gain is godliness. They suppose that gain is godliness. And what did he say? Turn away from those. Turn away. I've met preachers that really believe if they come riding up in a brand new Benz, people would believe what they say. If that's your thought as a preacher, you don't have any business riding up on a tricycle. If people are going to believe what you say because of what you drive, something's wrong. Something's wrong. John the Baptist was standing there in camel hair 
which pictured a death a camel had to die for him to have that oil. Standing in Jordan, another death. And people looked at him and he was eating wild honey and locusts. And man, they looked at him. But people believed what he said because God was with him. And I know people that believe if we just had the right sound system, if we just had the right audio, if we just had the right media, we could really get this out. You know what? If you believe that, you don't need a horn to blow through. You don't even need a, you don't even need a horn to blow through. Because it's not a sound system that makes us great. It is not a media ministry that makes us great. It's an almighty God. We're His. We're purchased by His blood. We belong to Him. He's our God. His hand is on us. And He will not fail us. He is our God. And He's with us. And He said, from such turn away. And then He said, listen, it is, it is apparent to me, Paul says, that we... Brought nothing in this world and we're not going to take anything out of this world. But we have food and raiment. Let us therewith be content. Now just think about it. We have food. He feeds me. What's He feed me? He, not just natural food. Thank God for my natural food. I'm thankful for natural food. You know, if you have a choice to have natural food or go hungry, I'd rather have food. And, and if I had a choice to have clothes or not, I'd rather have clothes. Just my fault. But spiritually, He's feeding me royally. Spiritually, He's feeding me Jesus every day. He's giving me living bread. He's giving me living water. He's giving me the finest of the wine of the kingdom. I am content with the food He's given me. And my raiment, He's clothing me in righteousness. He's clothing me in Jesus. He's clothing me in salvation. He's clothing me in a garment of praise. I'm becoming more thankful every day I live. I'm content with food and raiment. He is my Father. Hallelujah. He's clothing me. He's contending for me. Hallelujah. And he says, now with that, learn to be content. Learn to be content. Man, you've got to learn to think a little higher than just what you're putting in your stomach and on your shoulders. He feeds me with Jesus. He's showing me things I've never seen. He's, he's showing me a broken body on an old rugged tree. He's showing me a king and a throne. He's showing me a Lord that cannot fail. He's showing me a life that cannot be extinguished. He's showing me a connection that cannot be annulled. He's showing me a covenant that cannot fail. I am blessed because of Him. But then He said, listen, those of you that will be rich in this world, 1 Timothy 6, He said, you're going to fall into some temptations. And some divers tests and hardships. And he said, some have coveted after the money, have erred, swerving from the faith. For the love of money is the root of all evil. It's the root, the love of money. At some point, the world always says, follow the money, you'll find the root. Follow the money, wherever the money is. We know it's not the money. What God's interested in is the root. Because the root produces the fruit. And the root of my life is Jesus Christ. And the love of my life is Jesus Christ. And the favor of my life is Jesus, not money. And what does he say? He says, but thou, O man of God, flee these things. Flee these things. Flee these things. Follow love, peace, and charity after a pure heart and those that walk with God in a pure conscience. Fight the good fight of faith. Hold fast your confession of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. And then he says, you charge them that are rich in this world that they be not heady, high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Charge them that they be rich in good works, ready to communicate, willing to distribute, laying in store against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. There are some mornings that come with money. We must never be money motivated. I've known people that took the job for the money. They ended up miserable. I've known pastors that took a church for the money. They ended up miserable. This is not about the money. God is with us. You can't put money in the place of God. When you do that, you're going to struggle. Because God will say, now if that's what you really want, I'll let you have it. And man, I've seen some people really make a mess of their life when they started chasing the dollar. Don't forget the warning of 1 Timothy 6. Don't forget that. Now, if we are going to be rich in this world's goods, if I've sown a lot and I've reaped my harvest, then I'm going to have to be mindful that I'm going to have to stay very humble before God where money's concerned because money associated and when you begin to look at it and trust it, it causes a spirit of pride to enter into the heart if you let it. I know some rich people that are very humble. In my first church, we pastored a gentleman named Levin Smith who was a millionaire. He invited us to his house and we pulled up to his house. Me and Teresa found his house out in the country. And I'm not kidding. It was as big as our city. 
Well, pulled up there, he got tennis courts, he got a helicopter pad. I'm thinking, and this guy comes in, he's just as plain and ordinary, just as simple as he can be. Him and his wife loved me and Teresa, they took us out. I had no idea the man was, no, he drove a little Ford, what was it, a Ford Ranger truck with a cab on and then a little thing on the back. Never know, they pulled up there and I'm like, you got to be kidding this is bigger than our church and our house and everything we've got. It's huge. But he was very humble. Very humble. And I met a few other people just had a little bit of money and their head was so big they couldn't get through the door. <laughs> oh, I'm meddling this morning. Meddling right along. I've got to hurry. <laughs> Turn away from that. If you've got money, use it for God's glory. Man, if you got a nice car, thank God for it. Enjoy it every time you drive it. But let it be to the glory of God. You got nice clothes, let it be to the glory of God. If you got nice jewelry, let it be to the glory of God. And honor God with your finances. Remember the warning. Timothy, don't forget this. Charge them that are rich in this world. With money comes temptations. You know, with poverty comes some temptations. You know, there's some temptations poor people go through that rich people don't. There's some temptations rich people go through that poor people don't go through. Amen. Number three, number three this morning. You need to receive the witness and testimony of the truth that comes through the Melchizedek priesthood. And this is always the case. Ministers get off track when they make money the motivation. If we're going to have an event to raise money, wrong reason. Smith Wigglesworth said this about finances. He said, listen. As a preacher, if you need to be seen or need to be heard or need an offering, stay home. Stay home. If you need to be seen, heard, or need an offering, stay home. God can't use you. And there's a lot of truth in that. I don't need to be seen, don't need to be heard, and it's not about the money. I have a God. He supplies me. He's blessing me. Thank God. He is my source. Can I have an Amen. But Melchizedek comes and he's got in Genesis 14, 18 through 20, he's got bread and wine and then he blesses God and Abraham. And that's what Melchizedek does. When the Melchizedek priesthood shows up, he's got the body of Jesus broken. He's got the blood of Jesus to bless you. And then he blesses God. Blessed be El Elyon, the Most High God. And then he blesses you. And that's before Abraham prayed, before he gave, before he tithed. When I minister to people, I bless them, sinner or saint. Jesus died for every man. They're already blessed. The blood was shed for every man. Their sins are reconciled. The blood of Jesus is there. And I can bless any man, woman, boy, and girl. Jesus died for them. The Melchizedek priesthood comes with blood, with the body, and the blessing of the Lord in its mouth. And that's what you need to receive. You need to receive it. So let me do that for you this morning. Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. Jesus bore your curse and became your sin, took your death and died your death on that tree. The Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He took his blood into the heavens. He sprinkled the mercy seat on your behalf. He sealed an old covenant and finished it forever. He opened up a new covenant. He is your surety. He's your guarantee. He's your salvation. He is your blessing. Blessed be the most high God who gave you Jesus, who forgave you your sin, who filled you with the spirit, who anointed you with his power, who redeemed you by his blood. Blessed be the most high God and blessed are are ye for he has blessed you forgiven you receive it this morning you are the blessed of the Lord and the blessing of the Lord makes rich Annie no sorrow with it that's what God says but you have to receive that it's available to anybody but you have to receive it yes sir I receive your body broken yes sir I receive your blood on that mercy seat and yes sir I receive whatever you got in your mouth because he is my Melchizedek whatever's in your mouth I receive it because I know he didn't come to do me anything but good. He came to do me nothing but good. He put my old man to death on a tree, rose from the dead, made me a new creature, and he's doing me nothing but good. Father's not here to hurt me. He's not here to stop me. He is here to help me in every way. You got confidence in the blessing of the Lord. Amen? Then fourth, Abraham in Genesis chapter 14, he responded to God. You respond to God in worship, thanksgiving, and in the tithe. Abraham gave tithes. And again, hear this. You're freed from paying tithes. This is not some debt. This is not extortion money. So God will like you this week. You pay your tithes. That's not what this is. Abram gave tithes. 
tithes. And that's our heart. The giving of the tithe is the honoring of God in the first fruits. That's what it is. It's the gift. I'm not under obligation. I give willingly. I give cheerfully. Paul said it this way. Let every man purpose in his heart what he will give and how he will give. God loves the cheerful giver. I do it gladly, willingly. I give the tithe. And here's the key in Hebrews 7, 4. Now consider how great this man Melchizedek was that even Abraham gave tithes to him. It's not about church. It's not about helping the budget and all those things. And although those things are much lesser and I appreciate you helping and I appreciate your finances, the tithe is a recognition of how great Melchizedek is. Hebrews 7, 4. Consider how great, which the word great there in the Greek language, how distinguished he was. There's never been anybody like Melchizedek before or after. He comes without genealogy. He's a revelation of Jesus Christ in the old covenant. Consider how great he was that Abraham gave tithe to him. And Abraham blessed him and honored him. And Abraham was not under a law, was not under a curse if he didn't tithe. He did it out of faith. Do you see that? It's a recognition. The tithe is a recognition of how great Melchizedek is. Hebrews 7, 4. And then finally this morning as I close. Now you need to receive the wealth and treasure that comes through connecting with El Elyon. I want you to notice here that Abram in Genesis 14, what he did, he connected to El Elyon. You know the thing about it, he did not know that's who God was until Melchizedek told him. All he knew up to that point was that God had called him and God had spoken to him, but he did not know that he was dealing with the Most High God. And when Melchizedek came to him and said, El Elyon hath blessed you, what Abram heard was the Most High God. You know what? Let's just shout this morning. There is no God like our God. That's why the world has such a hard time because they have so many gods because they can't find one that satisfies you know, they got tarot cards and they got tea leaves and then they got crystal balls and they got witches and warlocks and Ouija boards and they got gods and religions. They can't, but my God satisfies. Jesus satisfies. He's God that satisfies. I don't need, I'm not looking for another God. I found the one that satisfies. He is my God and my Father. He never leaves me or forsakes me. He is the Almighty God. Hallelujah. And Abraham connected to Elion. You are dealing with the Most High God. And when Abraham gave the tithe, he connected himself to Elion in a new dimension. He connected himself. See, the tithe is a connection. It just connects you to God. The money's not the issue. God's the issue. See, if we say, man, if we just had the money, then we're thinking in a low place. But if we say, God's with us, we can do whatever he tells us to do. Come on, help me. God's with us. We, we're well able. Remember? We're not able for we see the giants and the sons of Anak and Arba the giant and the wall and fence cities. Are, the people are great. And in our eyes, we were grasshoppers. And in their sight, we were grasshoppers. We're not able. Caleb said, if God be with us, we'll kill them all. Caleb said, we'll kill every one of them. If God, if God, if God is in this house, if God... Listen to me. It, it's a supernatural miracle that certainly that I'm pastoring this church. It's a supernatural miracle that this church is still standing... But you know what? God woke me up this morning. It's the strangest way he's ever woken me up in my life. You know what he said to me this morning? It's crazy. I said, Lord, he woke me up. It's early. He woke me up and he said, Marietta Smith. And I thought about Marietta and those of you that remember her. She was a beautiful little uh, black lady about this tall that had... Uh, come from Jamaica here and born in, in, in Jamaica and came here and then she went to New York and married her husband and her husband died and she moved back here and she's about that tall very very sweet lady precious lady and, and really did love me I mean Marietta loved me about as much as anybody around here ever has she just really thought I was the best she, she just thought I was the best preacher and the best pastor in the world I like people like that hallelujah <laughs> good to have some of them around because you always got somebody to think you ain't worth nothing you know you, you they ain't hard to find. Hmm. Somebody said, aren't you worried about getting a big head? Now, there are enough people with pins around here to keep the air out of my head. I ain't got to worry about it. I ain't got to worry about no big head. There are enough people with pins to pop your balloon. Don't worry about that. But Marietta, she just thought I was the best. And so we got ready to build this building. We were at the old building. And Marietta came up to me with tears after one of the morning services. She said, Pastor, she said, the Lord told me to give $1,000 to the building program. I said, Marietta, 
I said, I know where you live, and I, I know, and I, I really appreciate that, but I can't take, I told her, I said, I can't take that. I can't take that. I, I just don't, she said, Pastor, the Lord told me to do it. And she handed me $400. And she said, now, I don't have the rest, but I'm going to pay, if I have to pay it a dime at a time, I'm going to pay that because the Lord told me to. You know, we got in the middle of this building program. And we were struggling and I was racking my brains because of all the problems we had trying to build this building and get on this property. And one day down at the old office I was in there and I was crying out to God and Marietta knocked on the door. And she says, Pastor, will you come out here and help me? She said, and she's so humble. She says, Pastor, I am so sorry to bother you. You're, you're a great man of God and you're probably studying and praying. I'm thinking, if you only knew, I'm looking at plans for a building and I'm crying because we're out of money and we're struggling and we got all kinds of problems. And she said, but, but I've got these two men in the van and they're, they, they, they've both been on a long drunk and, and, and they've sobered up enough now. They need Jesus. Will you come help me lead them to Jesus? Here's this little black woman in South Carolina. She's got two old white drunks in her van. Two white drunks. You don't see that every day. That's strange. And I get in the van and I can't hardly stand the stench of these two men. It's unbelievable. These two men have been in the gutter. You can tell. And Marietta's got tears running down her face. And she says, Pastor, lead us in a sinner's prayer. And I got on my hands and knees in Marietta's little old uh, dilapidated van. Prayed the sinner's prayer with those two men. Prayed for them to be healed. Prayed God deliver them and sober them up. They're crying. They said, yes, Jesus, yes, Jesus, yes, Jesus. And she says, thank you, Pastor. And I'm going to take them. And she took those two men back to her home. She took them in. She fed them. She clothed them. Kept them for a couple months and minister to them before she got them on her way. And there she's knocking on my door telling me I'm a great man of God. And I'm thinking, sister, you ain't got no... I know what great is and great ain't in here worried about a building. Great's out there getting drunks out of the gutter. To me, that looks a whole lot greater than building a building. Because Jesus didn't die for chairs or carpet or lights or sound system. He died for men like that. He died for the broken. He died for the drunkard and, and the blind and the beggar and the broken and the bruised. That's why He bled and died. To get men out of the gutter and save men and heal them and bless them. That's why He died. And so the Lord said to me this morning, Mary Adam Smith, and He reminded me of the widow's might. And that woman ended up in a nursing home. I, I went up there just about every week in Charlotte to see her before she passed. I did her funeral here in 2007. In the summer, I did her funeral. And you know what? She paid that pledge off. Oh, probably up to the last three or four times I saw her, she said, Pastor, I got my money. Here's another 30. And she'd, she'd write it down and mark it off. Pastor, my pledge, I got 30 more dollars. And the Lord said to me this morning, Marietta Smith, and I started thinking about Marietta and how she had touched my life. I won't ever forget her. I won't ever forget her. I will never forget Marietta Smith. She made a profound impact on my life. She was here like five years. She made a profound impact on my life. And the Lord said, remember when I sat and watched how they gave? She said, you know, there's a widow's might at open door, and her testimony will never be forgotten while there's an open door. He said, you know what? There are many reasons I've got open door where it is and for what it's about to do. But he said, one reason I kept it is because of Marietta's might. And then he whispered to me, he said, she's dead, but she's still speaking. Whew. So she's dead, but she's still speaking. Her arms have come up before me. Her, her gift of a thousand. And it's not about the thousand. It was about her heart. It's not the money that moved God. It's her heart. That woman had a heart. That woman had a heart that loved God and loved this house. That's what touches God. It's not the money. So I'm not going to stop and say, now all you will give a thousand dollar seed, you'll be blessed. I'm not going to do that. It's not the money. It's the heart that God's after. He said that just as clear to me. First thing he said to me this morning, Marietta Smith. And he said, there's a widow's might at open door. Because Jesus said against the treasury, and he watched not what they gave, but how they gave. How they gave. And how they gave. And he said to me, now receive. Because this is what Abraham said. And Genesis 15 opens up. And now he's gave tithe to Melchizedek. He's just turned down the world's way. And God says to him in Genesis 15, 1, Abram, fear thou not. I am with you, and I am your exceeding great reward. Let me look at this real quick. I want to show you one thing. I'm sorry, I'm going too long. Man, I'm having a blast. Hallelujah. <laughs> 
After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. This is Genesis 51 saying, fear not. That's peace. When I'm connected to God this way, El Elyon brings me peace. That word is wholeness or soundness. God delivers us from our fear. Man, isn't it good to be just without fear? You don't have nothing to fear today. He's your father. He's your God. He's covering you. He's got you. His arms are underneath you. He is your God. But then I am thy shield. He'll be your protection. He'll be your defense. I am your shield and I am your exceeding great, which the word there means I'm going to exceed great. I am way past your exceeding great reward. And this is the true blessing of the tither. And here's how I know, because the word for reward is sakar. Listen to this. It means, I'm just reading right out of a concordance. I'm not making this up. Payment of contract. Payment of contract. I am your benefit, I am your hire, I am your price, wages, reward, fair fee, passage, and money for all that is needed. Right there out of a Hebrew concordance. I'm not making that up. So what he's telling Abraham is, now, you just honored me in the tithe. And you didn't have to because there's no law. You didn't have to because there's no curse. But you did it out of a heart. Now, he said, now... Here's what I'm going to do. I'm, going, I'm coming to you as El Elyon. I'm your peace. And I'm your protection. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to defend you. I'm going to be your rear guard. I'm going to protect you. But I'm also going to make sure that I am your prosperity. I'm the one. I give you the wages. And the, later it says in Genesis 24, 1, And God did bless Abraham in all things. God is my salary. Hallelujah. God is my wage. God... I've got a God that can't fail. He's my Father. Hallelujah. Stand with me in Jesus' name. Man, I'll preach all day if you don't stand up. Praise God. Now look at this. Come on, read it with me. Isaac sowed in the land, the land of famine. Look at it. He received in the same year a hundredfold. Let's mark the blessing. Number one, a hundredfold. That's the fourth dimension. That's the hundredfold realm. It's the seed, the blade, the ear, full corn in the ear. Hundredfold. That's the fourth dimension. That's the barn level. And notice, he received that, and then the Lord blessed him. Number two, the Lord blessed him. Next verse. Number three, the man waxed great. You know what greatness is? Greatness is when God is your source, and God is your supply. Greatness is not us doing great things. It's God being our source. That's number three. Number four, he went forward. How would you like to go forward this morning? I want to go forward in the Lord. I want to go forward in ministry. I want to go forward in this church. He went forward. Man, I'm tired of going backwards. I'm tired of three steps forward and two steps backwards. He went forward. When you connect to El Elyon, we're going forward in this. There ain't no backing down now. That's number four. Number five, and grew. Praise God. I'm growing. Praise God, I'm growing. You know, God don't grow big ministries. He grows big people. Big people do big things. But God's growing me. God's growing you. He's growing you, praise God. And he grew until he became very great. Next verse. He had possessions of flocks and herds and great store servants. And the Philistines envied him. Man, can you imagine? I can, can't you? Think of it. Hundredfold. The Lord blessed him. He waxed great. He went forward. He grew. He became great. Had possessions. And the world envied him. Eight blessings connecting with the giving of the tithe. Can you imagine God doing something here on his property where Lancaster drives by and say, I don't know what them people do or what they got, but there's something strange about that. Because that people right there, they are blessed. That's the way it should be. We are blessed of the Most High God. We are blessed of El Elyon. We are connected to him in Jesus' name. Can you receive it? All right, Father, now thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. And thank you for what you've given and what you've done. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I praise you. Thank you. Thank you. And that's what I hear the Spirit of God saying. No, you don't have to. No, you don't have to. I'm looking for the heart that wants to. I'm looking for the heart that desires to. I'm looking for the heart. Not the mind that says, well, I'll do it one day when I get enough. But the heart that says, I'll start where I am. That's what the Lord's looking for. And Father, I thank you, Lord. We connect to you today. We connect to you. We connect to El Elyon. We connect to El Elyon, the high. You're a holy God.
And God, I repent of my thinking because I've thought for a long time, if we just had the money, and Lord, I'm just, I'm just laying that thought down. I have you, and you're more than enough. Man, that's setting me free. I've got him. He's El Shaddai. Hallelujah. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's Jehovah Nisi. Sid Kenu Shamorea Shalom Rapha. El Shaddai. He is the mighty God. Amen. Now, Father, I thank you and I praise you and I bless you for your goodness and mercy, your supernatural grace. Thank you, Lord, right now. Now, let the elders and ministers come forth quickly, please. Please come. And if you need prayer, please don't leave without being prayed for. If you're hurting in your body, you need help, you need instruction, you need encouragement, please let us pray for you. I love you, Open Door. You're a blessed people. I'm so glad I don't ever curse Open Door. Now, I used to say some dumb stuff about the property. I ain't never cursed you because I don't believe in that. But I used to say things like, you know what? Listen, listen to me talk my doubt and unbelief. You know what? We were a lot better off in that old building. You know what? That's a bowl I right out of hell. And yet, pastor's saying that. So pastor's saying that. i got a pretty good idea. That's not good. You know what? We're well off today. You know why? Because he's our God. Ah, oh, come on. We're well off today because he's our God. It ain't like he stayed down there at that old Sears building and sent us up here by ourselves. He said, y'all go on up here. I'll catch you later. He didn't do that. He moved right here with us. I got more mindful of what we didn't have and who wasn't here than what he is and who he is. God forgive me. God forgive me. I just repent of it in Jesus' name. Lord, we're a blessed people. You're Elion to us. You're the most high God. Jesus is our source and supply. Hallelujah. And Lord, I thank you right now. So bless your people this week. Show us. Show us. Lord, as we connected to you this morning in the giving of the time, show us your peace. Show us your protection. And show us your prosperity. Thank you, Lord. Increase, increase, increase. I just speak increase over the people. And I thank you now. And so as I close this morning, I lift my heart as a Melchizedek priesthood and I bless you. The Lord bless and keep you. Listen to that. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and the Lord give you peace. This is the blessing of the Lord that makes rich adding no sorrow with it. It's the blessing of Abraham. It belongs to you if you're Christ, you're Abraham's seed. Now receive it, believe it, walk in it, and share it everywhere you go. In the mighty name of Jesus, you are blessed and highly favored. The altar's open. Don't forget the week's schedule. And you are blessed as you go to share the gospel in Jesus' name. Amen.